Next up on the number one T. Okay, so getting into the book, uh, the four concepts that I want to talk about is uh, I'm just going to read them each off and then we'll start with the first one. But the first one is think small, play big, and then anger makes us stupid, make practice real, and then make pressure your friend. So let's start with think small, play big. And at the beginning of this chapter, you use there were two quotes in the book that really hit home for me. And and the quote in this one, I, I really, I really loved. And it is only those who risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. And I just think that hits home, especially for this sport in particular. So let's talk about it. What do you mean when you say think small, play big? Well, you know, with the with the play big, of course, it has to do with this, you know, the creating the biggest vision. If anything was possible, what I really want, and the fifty four is towards that. We we don't know which century someone is going to shoot fifty four, but it doesn't matter to us. It's just seeing we have these human capacities and possibilities, and if I start climbing there, it might take me a lot further than I ever knew. So we, because many say, well, you shouldn't do that. It's not realistic and all of that. But we have never seen it like that. That mm-hmm. if we actually dare to dream and uh, go for it. Well, and, and imagine. And, and imagine and all of that. And then the the second step is to make it then small. What are actionable things under my control, steps I can take? And, and and many have gone, for example, goal setting. They've learned to, I should set a goal, like I should have a single digit handicap or I should, you know, have a putting average. But we found that the bigger vision and then come down to what is controllable has been a better way for most scoffers. Yeah. And and I, I'll put it this way. The, the, the dream has to be big. It needs to be compelling. You know, it's kind of the energy of the whole thing. So like this, I mean, be audacious to set a goal or set a vision about yourself as a golfer, you know, towards something that really is compelling, not pressure. It's compelling. Like I'm excited to go after this thing. But then, so that has a lot of energy in it, but then it needs to come down to what are you going to do? (laughs) So, and you know, how are you going to show up and actually be accountable to this in in these smaller goals so we've actually done the same with our whole company we've never we have never set any traditional goals whatsoever we just we have this vision for the game and then we keep taking action towards that and we never knew what's going to happen or whatever but we keep taking action yes (laughs) i actually have a similar feeling about my company too like i i don't really know where this is going but i'm going to keep showing up I'm going to keep doing these small tasks and we'll see where it goes. And I'll tell you, uh, three years ago when when I started this, uh, I didn't realize I'd even be right here today. So uh, that's that's so that's great. Yeah. yeah. So you also talk about things we can control and things we can't control on the golf course in this chapter. How do those how does that fit with the think small, play big concept? Well, it's it's in it's so huge for every golfer <laughs> on the planet because yeah you know when we got in the golf course m- many care you know they care about how they're gonna score or how they're gonna do the match or only how are they gonna do on that one hole it's all about the outcome which is great we want a good outcome but the only way to get the good outcome is to know do you know what if I really see the ball flight before stepping into the shot. And if I hold my finish, and if I have those small things that are under my control, I'm more likely to get the ball in the hole. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly, incredibly important for the game of golf to learn to come back to actions I can take for every shot that that fit me and help me along. And it's missing from most golfers. Yeah. I mean, when we we do an exercise in the golf school about what is that completely 100% under control and what is not under your con- control and then like what things can you influence? But it's it's really, I mean, an epiphany for some to go, oh, you mean I can't control my swing <laughs> or I can't control my score or I can't control those people that I play with? <laughs> you know, no, it just can't. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and then to give up that energy and put your energy into something that is a hundred percent under your control, which like 
as we talked about, like a decision. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, you don't know if you're going to make the right decision on every shot, but you still like it's under your control to make one, yeah. and then 100 percent commit to it. So we, we, you know, so we asked our golfers after they realized that that the board, before they play, they pick a playing focus, something they're going to focus on that's under their control, and if they do it, they know it helps the golf game. Or Lynn likes to call it the playing promises. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, just because it's got a little more emotion to it, but. <laughs> Yeah. You know, you're going to set this promise before the round. Yeah. I promise myself I'm going to do this no matter what. <laughs> and then come off the golf course and say, I kept that promise. Yeah. yeah. Why do golfers tend to reach for excuses? Do you think? Like, uh, I hit a bad shot and it's because of X, Y, and Z. Like, why does that, do you think that's just like makes us feel better? Uh, like, why does playing a poor round of golf or what we think is a poor round make our attitude or you know why does it sometimes spoil the day you think why does it why why do we get in a dark place sorry well, I, had to go I, there. I think i think a whole culture and it's not just in golf but it's it's set up a lot that you know we be, become identified with our performance yeah. <laughs> well yeah. i am a birdie oh no i'm a double bogey you know oh my god you know I mean, yeah. I remember way long time ago, it was a junior clinic. This was 30 plus years ago. And I asked this group of juniors, like, how many of you think you're your golf score? And maybe out of 100 kids that day, like 95 of them raised their hand. Huh? That they felt their self-worth was tied to this golf score, you know. So like Pia said to me, it's very cultural that we identify with our accomplishments to a point where, you know, oh, yeah, I am this golf score, but we're not. But then, you know, what other people think of me is a big deal for, you know, most of us. And then, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, but, you know, whatever, have some excuse. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I think we're doing for protect ourselves because we still need the approval of others or we feel identified by our, our performance. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just saying that is... We identify it's really, it's, with you know, it's it's sometimes it's good training. Like if someone you know plays in a tournament and you know friends ask you you know how was it today and you know depending on your handicap level. But let's say I'm a ten handicap golfer and I didn't have a good day. That I can just say, well, I I had ninety eight strokes today and not say anything else and walk away. It's really hard. Yeah, yeah. To not condition. <laughs> I mean, to explain yeah. yourself, like right. you feel the need to have yeah, to said, explain oh, you know, the I didn't sleep so good last night. So, you know, it was really hard and, you know, it wasn't that good and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's it's, a good point. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So let's get into the next concept that I want to talk about. Anger makes us stupid. So again, we're out on the golf course. Things are not going our way for whatever reason. And, you know, you could start to get angry. Why does that make us stupid? <laughs> well, it's actually based on a little bit of neuroscience. Mm-hmm. And when we wrote the book, it was kind of fun because we had just been introduced to some of this new neuroscience is that when we have, you know, negative emotions and they lean towards more um, amplified negative emotions like anger, actually what happens is there's a place in the brain that gets affected and it's called there's a really fancy word for it. it's called cortical inhibition <laughs> so all that means is that your cor- your prefrontal cortex gets inhibited it means it doesn't work you don't have access to it and it's kind of what happens with <laughs> test anxiety or road, road rage. rage people do really stupid stuff because mm-hmm. they only in fight and flight yeah and so now you're in this place where you can't access perspective And you actually can access coordination coordination or visual acuity. And, you know, and unfortunately, people say some really not so good things under that state. Mm -hmm. And later, when they now have cortical facilitation, (laughs) they actually have, you know, access. They go, I should never have said that. But at the time... They were kind of made stupid by yeah. this emotional spiral. So yeah. in golf, the ones that build up the frustration and <clears throat> anxiety and anger, they can feel like, you know what, my swing is cooked. I can't access anything. I can't feel it. Or the putting goes off the planet because they lost. They can't access their feel or mm-hmm. they're hard time making decisions or like Lynn said, make not so good decisions. So we can see that happening. So it's, we're all going to get the anger or frustrated, but recognize it and then let it pass or shift more towards another emotion that 
can give me access to what I know. Yeah. And obviously, where it becomes really, really important for all level golfers is, you know, after I've hit the shot that I, you know, I realize that also part of this is that if I stay more objective to shots I don't like, the brain doesn't pick it up as much as memory. So it's, it's learning the whole, in the later books, we talk much more about it, but it's learning a process, what to do between shots and learning a good process for yourself after a golf shot and you've been sticking your finish and what to do those next 10, 15 seconds. Yeah. yeah. So and, what, mm-hmm. sorry, and, and you pretty much just touched on it, but what's your, the best thing, the best advice that you can give to a player that's had a couple bad holes in a row, or maybe they just had a hole where they got a 10 on or a big number, or they had a bad front nine, like how, what's the first couple steps we can take to get out of that cycle? Well, you know, for most is some need to just sprint to the next tee and just get some energy out (laughs) or, you know, and, you know, or, you know, do a few jumping jacks or sometimes physically just get the tension out of the body. Mm -hmm. It's often manifesting like tension. So that, or some people just like to take, you know, four or five really deep breaths and because many get so tight and they stop breathing. So it's about getting in a better state and that better state for some like it do it physically you know, we're, you know, jumping or sprinting a little bit or some like it physically with the breathing. Some just want to go to, I'm just going to get this sense of being at the beach in Hawaii and feel calm and peaceful. <laughs> they do it more emotionally, but you need to switch your state. Yeah. Whether or, it be physically or mentally or, or emotionally. You know, or some just like, even, you know, Annika Sørenstam way back, she would like stand on the tee box looking at the ball, counting the dimples. But all was that was not to get the mind to race and worry about things. Just come back and get present and do something. So getting present and getting in this state that you know you have more when you play back good and get yourself back towards that. Yeah. yeah. And, well, I know this wasn't your question, <laughs> but I want to add to it. Absolutely. When you hit a shot that's great, good, or good enough, make sure that you associate with mm-hmm. those shots and mm-hmm. take them in and make them a memory mm-hmm. and really now start to build more of an upward spiral. Yeah. Because a lot of people go out on the golf course and they play at neutral or some level of the downward spiral. That's interesting. You know, like hesitation to confusion to frustration to anger to I hate golf, you know. Um, but we we know that if you start to take in your good shots or good enough shots, like, hey, it went down the fairway. It's on green grass. OK, <laughs> I mean, I'm being a little silly here and facetious, but hey, it's good enough. Yeah, and and you build upon those, you can now start an upward spiral. Mm-hmm. And a lot of golfers don't realize that that that's under your control. Yeah. By the way, you emotionalize your outcomes. Yeah. Well, and that's crazy to think that most golfers are at a neutral or downward spiral state when you know there's such thing as a golf bug, or you know people love this sport like they yeah. keep coming back, but yet we're on the course and we're not having a good time or what that's crazy well i I think you know the the perfect golf shot no matter what handicap (laughs) level you have you know there's still not that many of them during the round so it's still a game of that you need to be okay with like lynn said it's good enough let's move on not trying to be perfect because it's not going to happen out there Mm -hmm. so that's why this mindset about the game is so huge Uh, and and, you know and, and with the just to finish off what you asked there after a bad hole or whatever, bad front nine, but it, it is changing the state like I talked about, but then give yourself like one thing that you can commit to that you know is going to help yourself. But instead of like worrying about, am I going to keep on playing badly, blah, 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 like, like something. And it could be as simple as like, I'm going to hold my finish for two seconds because I know it always helps me. Mm-hmm. Or I'm doing extra slow tempo swings because I keep it in play. That you have some small task you give yourself to start getting on the upward spiral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, next up, make practice real. What about practice can people start to do better at? 
to uh, make more everything. of a difference in their day. <laughs> or just starting to practice. Oh. <laughs> so it's a really passionate subject for us. And obviously our second book, The Game Before the Game, was about that. And we've we've we written a lot about it. We've spoken a lot about it. And it's still, I'm shocked that it's 2023. Sure. And people are still practicing in a very archaic well, way. Well, you know, I think the, the, <laughs> the biggest thing is to learn is like whatever we practice in golf and life, we get better at, mm-hmm. you know, whatever we practice. But if we think about, um, you know, so if I want to be better at golf, we need to be clear about how golf is played. Is this played with only one try and it's played with, you know, different shots, different targets. There's a lot of variability to it. So when most golfers go to a driving range and they are scrape and hit golf balls to the same target with the same club, with no breaks, it's like they're practicing tennis, hoping their volleyball game is going to get better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just a big foundational mismatch between the range culture and the golf course. So we say you need to decide, you want to be good at practicing on the range or do you want to be good at playing golf? Yeah. And yeah. then, of course, you can be in the range, but you actually, you know, treat each ball with more respect and you change clubs and you change target. And it's so it's a, it's a different mindset to, to start with to make it a time that's going to have a chance to make you a better golfer. Yeah. Absolutely. And like last book, we did everything about because so many we came across, you know, they say they want to practice, but in reality, they're busy lives and they don't have time to practice. They warm up maybe a little bit and then they play. So we just started adding more things that you can practice while you play, while you play with your group of friends. You just bring exercises out with you on the golf course that is more doable for most people. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And I guess also for me, and I mean, for both of us, is that I see people who do commit time to practice, okay? And they're like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to hit X amount of balls, but they still aren't educated enough into how they could use that time more wisely. And they hit a lot of balls. Let's say they hit 108 irons in a row or, I mean, no. And then then they go out and play and they don't play better. And that to me is like, oh my gosh, we just got to help them be able to to make this a real deal. So there's there's legitimate transfer to to better performance on the golf course. Mm-hmm. And you guys have well, you mentioned three different types of practice, and I love this: maintenance practice, performance practice, and future practice. Yeah. Yeah. What are the differences between those? Yeah. So, so the maintenance is for everybody to know, just like you do maintenance on, on your car, you, we do maintenance as humans. We eat food and we sleep and we do maintenance so we're functional. So it's just known for my golf game. Like for me, for example, I know maintenance for me is to check my posture because it has a tendency to get to, to upright because I just slip back to that. The maintenance for me is tempo because it can easily get too fast. I know those two things are probably for as long as I'm, play golf till I'm 95, hopefully, need to check on those often. It's not to improve things. It's just making sure I don't slip back into uh, bad habits. So what I mean, and I'm you? entirely different. I My maintenance, and it will always be this way as long as I play golf, I get too far away from the ball. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And it's not that I don't understand that. It. It's just a <laughs> tend- physical yeah. tendency yeah. about it. Yeah. And then it looks, you know, of course, technical. And the golf swing that shows up when I'm too far away from the ball is not not mm-hmm. my best. And um, also then I'm not tempo so much as I am tight in my hands and I have a lot of body tension. So I've got to do things through the round to, yeah. to take out that body tension, but that's, you know, I need to practice that and do that kind of maintenance. So maintenance should just be a couple of things that I know tendency I need to check up on. And then, then the, the performance practice is make sure that you actually practice more the way the game is played on the course. Yeah. So you know, maybe, you know, it can be simple. So, you know what, I've been working my driver, but I'm going to hit like five different drivers and I'm going to imagine being on the first hole and the third hole and I'm going to go through the routine and see how many of those fairways I hit that you you put it into performance. Or you might have nine holes on the putting green and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, putt here and actually see how many one or two putts I can have that you bring in the performance aspect, the way golf is played on the course. Or or even to bring in things that bother you. So like if you're a person who doesn't like people talking when you're, mm-hmm. when you're swinging, 
bring them to practice and ask them to yak away so you can learn to focus. Yeah. I mean, that would be a part of performance practice. You know, go to that side of the range or the padding green where they're all talking away. So I'm going to learn to focus anyways. That's yeah. really good. And future practices, the things I'm going to learn now, but it's not going to show up right away. But I need to, you know, maybe do it once or twice a week so I can be good a month from now, two months from now. So like in fitness training, strength training, we know that just because I do bicep curls today, it's not going to maybe have an effect till I keep on doing it a couple of times a week for mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. next month. So for many could be learning a new shot. Like, you know what? I'm not going to use it yet, mm-hmm. but I'm learning how to hit this flop shot over a bunker yeah. or making a swing change for some, or, it, you know, it could be like, some have a hard time with how they react after shots, and they have to stay with that a long time. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, they might learn anger makes us stupid, and they learn some of the neuroscience, but they don't realize it's actually now a new skill yeah. that won't show up, you know, consistently yet as a skill or a habit until they put some practice to yeah. it. Mm-hmm. So we often say that that uh, the the future practice you don't give yourself too many of those because yeah. <laughs> they need a little time and for not when you have important tournaments because then you want to more you know do performance practice and maintenance and you know and do things mm-hmm. that you know you do when you play well so it's learning to time those things yeah uh the, right now we're in Arizona and so January and February and most of December too is pretty much off season for competing and so this is when I take my lessons and I'll I'll get a handful of lessons during this time. And yeah, I'll go to the range. I'll practice, you know, the certain, you know, maybe two or three things that I'm working on. And I kind of give myself grace out on the on the course and say, okay, maybe that stuff shows up. But if it doesn't, like, I'm not going to concentrate on it on the course yet. But when I'm going out to practice or have the lessons, I will concentrate on it yep. there. And then I just have to have faith that at some point, they'll, it will start to show up on the course, you know, just from past experience too. Yep. So. Yeah. Yep. That's good exactly. separation. Yeah. yeah. What What's your uh, take on short game and full swing as far as practice? Are you, you know, do you try and give it a percentage, like practice your short game 60% of the time or... Um, are you just focusing on what you need to work on the most? What's your take on short game first full swing? Well, I mean, there's a you know general tendency golfers practice it too little because it's such a big part of your game. Mm-hmm. So you know, many need to often start with the putting and short game practice before they go to the range because if they start with the range, many don't leave Never because they yes. just feel good enough yet or I don't have it yet, and then oh, I don't have five minutes left for all the rest mm-hmm. of it. So. Mm-hmm. So often starting starting there and it's been for many very important and you know but you know some people have just they're good they're intuitively good at short game and actually don't need to practice it very much. So you know so it all depends on the golfer too. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I guess too, like obviously practicing more of the scoring shots. They're called scoring for a reason. <laughs> and, you know, that would be more of your short game shots. And mm-hmm. um, and I think at any, you know, let's say you're a new golfer to the game, you're going to you're going to learn how to score by knowing those skills early on. But if you wait to practice those skills as a new golfer, you know, until you had this long game, I think I think the game gets really frustrating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I mean, super that, frustrating. Golfers that don't know, at least, you know, we say, I mean, do it 50-50. It's a very good starting point and see what happens to your game. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, even telling, saying, start with that first, start with short game first when you go out to practice. I mean, that's the sim- simplest tip ever, but it's so true. And yeah. it, could, it could amount to so much. Okay, so to finish up the practice sector, I just want to talk about the difference between practice and warming up for a round. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that's a biggie. Uh-huh. Because we see so many getting themselves in such a bad state on the range and stressed and worried and you name it. So we, we totally want the people to realize like warm up is only warm up. The only <laughs> point of warm up is the feeling that your body and swing emotion is warmed up and that you create a confident state. Yeah. Yeah. So all that matters is that I'm ready to go. So we it doesn't matter if I if I do jumping jacks and 
I feel good. That's my warm up. <laughs> or <laughs> if I just want to hit, uh, do some stretching, and I hit hit wedges and one driver, and I feel good. Good. So it's being creative, and we usually now give them like options to try to figure out what works what, best for them. Yeah. Yeah, but where where it can go south is. <laughs> You go to warm up and you hit a couple shots that aren't good. You know, you might top a couple or shank a couple or whatever. And then you start to try to fix it. Yeah. (laughs) And then that fixing turns into now I'm trying to, you know, now I'm actually trying to practice and I'm getting myself into a state of high cortisol and frustration. And, you know, um, I'm already in a more diminished state and all I'm trying to do is warm up. And so so to take outcome out of warm up is a really big deal for many. You so, know, so it really doesn't. There. There's no correlation no. between how you hit it in warm up and what's going to happen on the golf course. And every golfer will say that. Have you ever hit it really good in warm up and then you went out on the course and it's gone? And they said, Yeah. <laughs> and they asked, Have you ever had it like not so good in warm up and suddenly it comes together on the course? I said, Yeah. <laughs> yeah so exactly. there's no correlation i mean sometimes we get so nervous if, even with the tour player they're striping it on the range i mean well, i get that's when i get nervous because <laughs> we know the expectation levels are like that yeah and yeah. if they it's a very good chance they're going to go on the golf course it might be good but it's not that, that good, good. And they start, sustainably that good <laughs> so the mindset the warm-up is really important and understand too that this warm-up is to check in on my emotional state, is checking in on my adrenaline, it's knowing, you know, maybe feet together is good for me or slow tempo swings are good for me. Just finding your rhythm of getting getting going, getting ready, feeling warmed up and feeling clear about what you're going to focus on. That's what it's all about. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so the final concept, make pressure your friend. I This could be my favorite one. Um, so why is this one of the concepts in this book? <laughs> because it's something that we feel every golfer, every level experience that you see, feel this perceived pressure <laughs> because maybe you're on your way of lowering a handicap or people are watching you. You're not used to that, or you're about to win a major championship. It can be any of those, but that perceived, and we all change when that happens. Yeah, exactly. Yes. All of us change. And it's super normal. Yeah, something happens. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some start thinking more, some get tight, some get so Swing much adrenaline, too fast. <laughs> some start like over preparing decisions. So we want players to be super curious. So when you are in that pressure place, what happens to you? Because when you know what happens to you, you can start doing something about it. But thinking like saying, oh, just pretend this everything is normal. Just pretend it's all practice. That doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's 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 knowing it's like super normal. We don't know a player who doesn't have this going on. But well, it's the ones that are honest and aware and can catch themselves. Yeah. I mean, we've had this conversation with former number one players in the world. And they're like, I just wish it felt more comfortable. We're like, it's never going to feel comfortable. It's not like it's ever going to be a walk in the park. You know, there's always going to be a certain amount of arousal associated with wanting to perform well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, but if you think about it that way, if you frame it more as arousal versus what will people think of me if I lose today or I shoot a high score today, I mean, so... It, and, and, and honestly, some people play better with a certain amount of, quote, pressure or more yeah. arousal or more adrenaline. Mm-hmm. So for some, they, you know, they actually need to get into a little bit of like that elevated state. They have a harder time they, they play start, better in starting that the round. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you use a concert pianist as an example in the book as far as you ask him do you still get nervous when you go out and perform in front of people and he goes he says something along the lines of yes I do but I now know what that feels like correct like I know what that adrenaline and nervousness feels like and I learned how to basically move forward with that going on so, you know, it, exactly. so your top player knows exactly. that, you know what, I need to lower my tempo a little bit or club down a little bit because the adrenaline is kicking in. Or they know my tendency is to over-prepare, so I just need to keep every decision-maker super simple because my tendency is otherwise going to kick in. 
or you know, I get so tight, so I'm gonna you know smile more, and it, so it's 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 being clear now. I'm here. I'm feeling it. I'm taking action on something to shift shift your state. And just out of curiosity, because I know you guys have worked with a lot of incredible female and male golfers, is there a difference between how females take on that feeling of pressure opposed to men? Do that, or is it all the same? Do do females tend to, or do males tend to embrace the pressure more? Is there is there a gender uh, concept to this at all? Well, I think so. Well, like yeah. it, I think, and it's come, you know, for many thousands of yeah. years. But I think that more of the men that maybe kind of, kind of, sometimes can deny that something is different inside of them. So mm-hmm. they just want, you know. So they need, and I think, you know, generally maybe more of the women are oversensitive to all the things that change inside of them. So it's like it's both end of the spectrums. <laughs> well, and I bring it up because it's very hard to fill individual women's tournaments whereas in the men's side the men's oh. individual tournaments sell out in a heartbeat yeah. and why is that what do women oh. not embrace that pressure as much it's, as the men no, it's, why it's, is it no actually it's it way way back when i was head coach in sweden and and some of these that study more sociology of people and sports and all of that and it's kind of in our genes but it's that you know Men from gazillion million years ago bond through competing and hunting, and that's how they create comfort. And through, you know, way, way back in time, the women create that connection through being together and in the connecting game and in the relationships. Yeah. So, you know, we still have those part of those things in us in humans. So I've always found that women can be equally good at competing. We just have a different journey towards it. And we can more, you know, striving, instead of beating other people, it's more striving for excellence and having a team and work together. So it's the more the definition of competition that often needs to change. And, you know, some of the most competitive golfers that are good at that we know are have been girls and women, that, but they've been allowed to develop in a way to find that competitiveness in something that doesn't go against their who they are as humans. Mm-hmm. And it isn't always about beating somebody as it is, I'm going to be my very best today. Yeah. 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 So the, the motivation is different. Yeah, I mean, it's entirely as I think sometimes the you know, traditional tournament system has been set up more by, by the men, and we just need to, you know, I think be more creative with all that. Thank you.